to introduce him is Professor Seth Bergenstein from Penn State, and he is a trailblazer. He's a trailblazer when it comes to anything about microbiome. So, Seth, telling a little bit about where I come from, where the microbiome sciences are at Penn State, uh, what we've been doing in various biological science areas, and then focus in on this particular topic. All right, so uh, we are uh, what's known as the One Health Microbiome Center at Penn State. And really what we're doing with this is merging two different academic themes. There's a microbiome centers consortium across the world, uh, founded in the United States, that has about 80 microbiome centers in it. And then there are about 100 academic One Health science units across the world as well. Um, and recently in the last year, we decided to take our expertise at Penn State and think more broadly about interconnecting these two disciplines and what's now known as the One Health Microbiome Center. And really what that means is we're studying with our experts and trainees the microbial ecology of human ecosystems, environmental ecosystems, and agricultural ecosystems. Um, and why we can do all three of these uh, instead of just one is because we have a really gigantic operation here at Penn State. The scales are just super impressive. So we have 540 members, 125 faculty in 42 departments, 160 graduate students that I'd love for any prospective graduate students or postdocs at Albany to think about us if you're interested in the microbiome sciences. Uh, we have a dual title microbiome sciences PhD degree, which is the first microbiome sciences degree in the world for a PhD. Um, and we have some preeminent uh, worldwide science education series, um, including this one called the Wolbachia Project, Discover the Microbes Within. So for more information, uh, check us out on the socials and our website here. Now in the Bordenstein Lab, we have I, what I think of as three thematic buckets to our scholarship. And the top two I'm not gonna get to today, the third one we will talk a lot about. Um, the first one is really untangling how a bacterial symbiont got to spread across the world inside arthropods. In fact, this symbiont known as Wolbachia is arguably the greatest pandemic from a biodiversity perspective in the history of life. It occurs in 50% of all arthropod species and arthropods represent 85% of all animal species. So you can extrapolate from these two numbers that we're talking about millions and millions of animals slash arthropod species that have this bacterial symbiont. So we study the genetics and mechanisms and also the applications to control harmful insects by, with this bacteria. The other two are interrelated. Uh, we ask questions about what are the rules of microbiome variation between host species. Um, we've coined and developed a, a term known as phylosymbiosis. Uh, and then the sort of flip side of that is what are the rules of microbiome variation within a host species? And there we've turned to human data uh, because it's publicly available, it's well sampled. Um, and we felt that there were important questions still to be resolved even in the human microbiome world that's very well studied today. So just to get everybody on the same page, I'm gonna give a brief overview of the human microbiome. <clears throat> uh, Many of us are probably aware that we have a biogeography to our microbiomes, that a skin microbiome has a different composition of bacterial species and abundances than, let's say, the gut microbiome or the oral microbiome. And overall, the total number of microorganisms in or on our body is 40 trillion microorganisms. And roughly speaking, we have about 40 trillion human cells. And so really that number is about half microbial and half human when we think about our cellular makeup. Uh, there are estimates of anywhere between 500 to 1,000 bacterial species in our, in our bodies or on our bodies. And in those microbial consortia, there's 100 times more genes uh, than the human genome because there's an incredible amount of diversity in these microbial cells, even though they're smaller and their genomes are tinier than ours because we have so many microbes that are so different the total genetic composition and capacities are really what we think about a lot of when we're thinking about how humans function in a world dominated by a microbial biosphere, and that's both in us and on us. I think many of us know that our genomes are highly similar in Homo sapiens, but our microbiomes are very different. And so when you think about what makes us different, what makes us unique, what makes us susceptible, 
to diseases and what makes us different could by and large rest in microbial traits and functions that uh, this ecosystem confers to us. And of course, what has gotten a lot of attention is that 90% of diseases essentially have some association with microbiome compositional changes. This doesn't mean causation, but it certainly opens up the door to thinking about how microbes contribute to conditions such as chronic diseases that we're still trying to figure out the basis of today. Now, if you opened a textbook on microbiomes and you turn the page to the human microbiome pages, you know, you might find something like these trends, that there is also a geography to the microbiomes of humans across the world. There's continental variation in microbiomes. Um, so it's not as if we exist in this complete homogenous microbial planet. There are islands of microbial uh, biology going on that affect the way humans interact with those microbes. There's, of course, the biogeography on our bodies where different uh, spots and anatomy sites have different microbiomes. I think uh, many of us have heard about the fact that, in, at least in westernized countries, our microbiome diversity is declining over time. And that may have something to do with the overuse of medications and hyperuse of hygiene practices, as well as alterations in our, in our diets. Um, and that diversity decline coincides with an increase in chronic illnesses, uh, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, inflammatory bowel disease, etc. So there's a lot to take in here, but these are kind of the headline trends that we read a lot about in the news um, and you would see kind of in the first few pages of a book on the microbiome. Um, what we've got a problem with, though, is if you were to ask how diverse are human microbiome data sets to date and therefore the conclusions we're making from them, it turns out there's an incredible bias as maybe none of, none of us would be surprised by towards white European ancestry uh, subjects being involved in those clinical cohorts. So this is a strong interest of ours and a paper came out last year that really summarized this nicely that showed in pink here the number of samples of microbiome samples in the databases and then from their ancestry or continental origin. And as you can see, uh, European ancestry dominates the data sets through time. Um, although recently, over the last couple of years, you can see that there's an increase in diversifying the microbiome sciences um, with a little bit of a push down in that pink category. But much like personalized genomics, where we have a very strong interest in understanding genomic diversity across human populations, it's interesting that sort of the microbiome world got ahead of itself, and here we are thinking we need to correct some of these wrongdoings in the way we're studying microbiome diversity ourselves. And so with that, we were inspired uh, really about 10 years ago to start thinking about highlighting this, this need in the field and also uncovering any potential important ramifications. Um, and what we did is we focused on the United States data sets that were publicly available at the time. There were two of them. One is the public funded uh, sort of crowdsourcing campaign called the American Gut Project, uh, which you can submit a sample to for 99 bucks and they'll give you your microbiome back. And then there's the NIH funded Human Microbiome Project. Now these were two American data sets done in two different, essentially very different ways. They were sequenced at different places. The types of subjects that they were incorporating were quite different. For example, the NIH Microbiome Project used uh, MSTP students, so MD, PhD students, mostly for their work. And the American Gut Project is a crowdsourcing campaign across the country. The reason we wanted to pair these very unequal data sets in our analyses was if there were any trends that existed between them, then those trends would likely be bona fide trends rather than single study artifacts. Um, and so that's what we're going to be looking for across the diversity of Americans in these two data sets. Um, I think we've made the case why this matters already, that there's a need to unbias genomic and now microbiome studies. Um, if we do that, we may be able to unlock some of the reasons for why we have treatable health disparities uh, in our country. And this is notable with respect to ethnicity and race because these two social categories vary with a lot of the big ones. Inflammatory bowel disease, colorectal cancer, obesity, heart disease, diabetes. And so maybe what makes us different with these health disparities is also the types of microbes that we have with us. Not only our lived experiences, but the types of microbes we get from those lived experiences. Now, when we talk about 
uh, disparities. There's a number of issues that affect disparities from healthcare access to education access to socioeconomic status, et cetera. And so I want to highlight that uh, this is a multifaceted concept that influences disparities in health. <clears throat> and um, when we take a look at sort of microbiome changes with respect to disease, especially disparity ones, um, sure, we can document that microbiomes are different in a disease state such as type 2 diabetes. So the color coding here just reflects the relative abundance of these phylum bacteria in the human gut. And we can see alterations in, let's say, a type 2 diabetes subject. But really what we're getting at further in these kinds of questions is, let's take, for example, colon cancer, which there are disparities in. There's a 20% higher incidence in blacks and a 40% higher incidence in more, or 40% higher mortality rate in blacks versus whites. Um, is this potentially related to microbiome causes or, or consequences of our lived experiences? Uh, this is why we think the question is quite relevant to tackle from essentially a diversity perspective of the microbes across the diversity of all of us. And important to note that when we think about these disparities, we think of them as preventable differences, that maybe policies, maybe uh, recommendations can guide the development of our microbiomes and therefore the development of these, uh, these disparities. So all in all, the end game re really is to think about how do we achieve health equity in light of these health disparities and in light of the potential uh, correlations to why there are health disparities through the microbial lens. All right, so one thing to, to also reflect on is that in human data, self-reported identity, such as ethnicity and race, is a social construct that captures many, many factors. And in fact, there's, they capture so many factors that ethnicity and race have been labeled as ghost variables, appropriately so in some respect, because there's so many things that underpin what it means to be a certain ethnicity or a certain race. And really, when we get to the bottom of this, we need to know what the structural drivers of these health disparities are and the lived experiences affect these social identity groups. But for the time being, the data we had in hand and the data we still really have in hand predominantly is self-reported identity. But what this means is we've got a lot of work to do to figure out what's underneath the hood of those social groups. So let's take that as we go through the talk today. If you look at our data sets from the Human Microbiome Project and the American Gut Project, um, there are broad phylum level bacterial differences in the 16S ribosomal RNA marker. Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes are the two dominant gut microbes of phyla. And as you can see across these self-identity social groups, there are some differences between them. But this is, of course, high level uh, reflection of diversity that, in fact, may, may or may not even hold if we were to look at multiple studies uh, beyond the two that we've looked at. I think what we really want to know is what's underneath the hood in terms of strain variation or species variation in the microbes. So uh, a former graduate student now at Stanford, Andy Brooks, took these two data sets and basically asked, what's the most consistent signal that associates with interpersonal microbiome variation between uh, ethnicities and races? And how does that relate to whether other factors associate with interpersonal microbiome variation? And so he looked at race and ethnicity, he looked at BMI, he looked at sex, and he looked at age, and we're reporting the p-value significance of whether these factors associate with interpersonal microbiome variation, and then the percentage of the variation that's explained by each of these categories. So adult age only explains 1% of the microbiome variation. BMI explains 5% of the variation, but race and ethnicity explain 5.1% of the variation. And most notably, it's the only category that replicated in both cohorts, the HMP and the American gut. Age, sex, and BMI, you can find significant in one study, but not in two studies. And that's exactly why we included both these studies, because these are variables that are hard to interpret given that they come and go in, in various data sets. Whereas this one stuck in both very different data sets. So it's suggested there may be something to look further into here. And when we do that, when we go to a level of biological categorization, like let's say genera of bacteria, or families of bacteria, Andrew and, and colleagues were able to find that there were 12 reoccurring bacterial genera and families 
that varied in abundance in the same exact direction across the American Gut Project and the Human Microbiome Project. So we're just showing three of these right here. Uh, and their abundances in the four uh, self-identity groups that were, that were part of the clinical cohorts. Among these 12 bacteria, 11 of them are what's called heritable from a population genetic perspective. That means that genetic variation in the human genome can be associate with the abundance of these particular microbes, right, microbial variation. And so it looks like there's this consortia of heritably linked bacteria that can rise or fall together in one particular uh, self-identity group versus another. And that was extremely interesting to us because we didn't think we'd be able to find reoccurring taxa that were consistently associated, never mind that they had some common features, uh, such as this consortia of heritable bacteria. Let's take a further look then. So this one right here, Christian Sinalaceae, is what's actually been found in the literature as the most highly heritable gut bacteria. So 40% of the variation in of the abundance of Christian Sinalaceae can be explained by human genetic variation. And not only is it the most highly heritable, but it's also associated with obesity in human uh, epidemiological studies and in mouse reductionist experimental studies. Um, and what that means is across the four self-identity groups that we were looking at, if you lack Christian Sinalaceae, you have a higher BMI statistically than if you contain Christian Sinalaceae. The degree to which can vary between the groups, but their three out of the four social groups have a significant impact of Christian Sinalaceae or association with it. So this is an important point because we can't be blind to um, social groups when we're thinking about human microbiome studies, that there may be differences between them that we have to take into account and essentially deconfound in some respects. So pushing this a little further, we can use uh, artificial intelligence tools to help us learn about the distinguishability of microbiomes. And when we use machine learning models, essentially we're taking input data, such as one person's microbiome, let's say it's my microbiome, and we put it into a training model to the computer, and then it spits back out whether it, that microbiome belongs to me or belongs to my wife or belongs to my, uh, my family. And so in this case, we'd hope that it would predict me. And the charts that determine the accuracy with which it found the right microbiome um, are displayed on these types of charts here. And what I want you to sort of focus on is there is a true positive rate and a false positive rate correlation. Without knowing much of the details, just know that if the line goes right through the middle, this is considered a random classification. It would not provide any predictive power. This is a good classifier, a better classifier, and then a perfect classifier essentially would have the whole line pushed over here and then over to here at the tips, at the edges. So with that visualization now, we can look at in the American Gut and Human Microbiome Project data, again, led by Andy and then collaborated with Ron Bleckman and his postdoc, Samwa, that in each of the two data sets, there's a predictive accuracy to identifying self-identity groups just with the microbiome data in of itself. And that tells us that there is distinguishability in these microbiomes. So where this gray line is the random prediction, everything else tells us there's support. And you can pre predict the accuracy of these values and sum them up through these numbers. And so anywhere between 70 to 80% accuracy in using this data to predict um, which group the microbiomes belong to. Now, this was all in adult data and it was all using 16S microbiome data. And it led us to the question of, well, when does this variation begin? If it's consistent across multiple data sets, could it begin in our early life rather than in adulthood, which is what we're measuring here? So, um, a former postdoc, Liz Malott, who's now at the Washington University in St. Louis, um, had done essentially the same type of work, but with childhood microbiome cohorts. Um, so we used a compilation of cohorts and ran them through our machine learning models. And what we were surprised to find to some degree is the models actually do better than the adult data. The predictive accuracy is over 90% relative to the 70 to 80% in the adults. Now that indicates that the signal of distinguishability of these microbiomes, whether it's with respect to self-reported race or self-reported ethnicity, is stronger in childhood and suggests that there may be a acquisition point of when this begins in childhood and then it starts to taper off into adulthood, perhaps because of our lived experiences that uh, diversify our microbiomes over time. 
Now, notably, if you compare the taxa that associate with self-reported identity groups in the adults versus the children, the whopper is, is that half of the children associated microbes with these self-identity groups also occur in humans. That was very surprising to us. It suggests that there may be some continuity of microbes acquired early in life that associate with ethnicity and race through our whole lives. Of course, then our adult lives acquire much more microbes and we get a lot more diversity here. Okay, so let's think about the age structure then of these microbiome associations and maybe when can we pinpoint when they emerge during childhood. Now a classic result in the human microbiome literature is that our microbiome diversity in our guts start off low early in life and then they increase and plateau essentially after three years of life. So there's a strong statistical correlation of microbiome diversity across age groups. And we can see that both in the letters up here distinguishing significantly different uh, alpha diversities, which is just the number and types of microbes that occur at these stages. And then this is an ordination analysis. It also shows significant clustering of color-coded age groups relative to their microbiomes. And so um, this value here tells us about 8% of the variation in the microbiomes can be attributed to the age of those particular children. Now, prior to three months of age, we do not find any evidence of race and ethnicity associated variation. So this is the ordination analysis where the p-values are not significant um, and the r-squared values are modest. They are modest throughout this study, but because we don't have significance here, um, we don't have a signal yet. Now that could be due to sample size issues because we have a small sample size here, um, or it could be due to that we just don't have a signal yet in these very immature microbiomes that haven't developed fully yet. Now after three months of age, uh, we start to see the race and ethnicity signal emerge. Uh, we had significance and we have, again, modest association values. Now what this tells us is that somewhere before or just after three months of age, the microbiome differences start to become a little bit more complex. At three months of age, children experience many different changes. They go to school, uh, to preschool that, or daycare. They'll go and have more diverse foods. They'll, they'll live out their lives in a more social way, perhaps. And so it's interesting that the microbiome differences also coincide with a period when their lives are becoming very much more um, alive, if you will, and, and diversified from a social perspective. From one to three years, and then three to 12 years, which the data is not shown here, just showing the one to three, again, we have this uh, strong significant association with modest association values. And so when we see now that there's a childhood signal and then there's an adult signal, um, we really would like to know, and we think this is a multi-decade question to answer, you know, what's the cause of this kind of variation? And one of the things we did uh, with a clinical cohort study was we asked, does the diet or geography account for microbiome variation across these self-identity social groups? And we did that in a clinical cohort in which we recruited subjects from the Nashville area. Um, they were all adults, so we're looking at adult gut microbiome variation, aged 18 to 40 years, uh, all females. Their BMIs were normal. These are generally healthy individuals with no recent medication use. Uh, they all eat Western diets. That was a requirement, and uh, you'll see why in a second. Uh, and then we recruited white and black uh, self-reported individuals uh, into our study. Our sample sizes are modest here. This is a very expensive experiment because we essentially controlled the diet of these individuals uh, for several days. So we have a total of 36 healthy females across two cohorts that went through a diet in which they were on their own diet, and then they go on a four-day vegetarian diet intervention, and then they go back to their original Western diet. And our hypothesis is if diet causes the microbiome variation we see in adults, then maybe everybody going on the same vegetarian diet would reduce or eliminate the microbiome variation. So here's what that might look like. If there is a dietary effect, then we would see differences before the diet. Their microbiomes would converge while on the diet because they're eating the same foods, and then they come off the diet. And when I mean they're eating the same foods, I mean they're eating exactly the same foods. We gave them all their meals, which is why this was quite an expensive endeavor. Uh, we also have this opposite hy hypothesis. So there's no dietary effect, and therefore the microbiome variation will persist before, during, and after uh, the diet. So 
that's the basic premise of the work. And while this is a small dietary intervention, there is press in the literature that even within 24 hours, a dietary study could flip the microbiome variation from, let's say, a vegetarian composition to a more carnivore or Western diet kind of composition. So not unreasonable to think we might see something here. Now, during the dietary intervention, we had a few aspects that really required some people to dig in. Uh, these were all three you know, plant-based meals a day and one snack per day. We had calorie content personalized to maintain their weight. And they could not drink caffeine, they could not eat chocolate, and they could not drink alcohol. So these were uh, warriors for participating in this particular study. Uh, some of the reasons we did this was because the metabolism signatures of caffeine and chocolate uh, can really have a big impact on the metabolomes, uh, which we also measured uh, during the study. Um, so if you cheated, if you were subject and cheated on this experiment, we might see like a spike in caffeine in the bloodstream, and we did, uh, and would uh, on rare occasions have to exclude those individuals, uh, assuming they might have had a cup of coffee or two or three. So uh, going back to this original study and hypothesis, we are measuring uh, multi-omic traits across different body sites. So in the saliva and in the stool, we're doing metagenomics and viromics. And in the blood and the urine, we're doing metabolomics, okay? Uh, mostly we'll focus on the metagenomics of the oral microbiome and then the fecal microbiome, so the saliva and the stool. Now here's the dietary profiles, just to show you that the macro and micronutrients were different um, bef like when they were on the habitual diet versus when they went on the study diet. Okay, so here's cohort one and cohort two. The habitual diet is significantly different from the individual study day diets. Remember, there were four study days, and each study day diet was slightly different from the other one as well. Um, the same is also true in large part for cohort two, but there's a little bit more overlap in the signals here. All right, so when we look at the microbial communities, uh, what we're asking here and showing here is, each individual is color-coded with a sample of their fecal microbiome or their oral microbiome across the dietary intervention. And rather than everybody's microbiome being intermixed across the dietary stages, what these dendrograms or clustering analyses show is that microbiomes are personalized across the dietary study. That there's a strong individuality to microbiomes in the fecal cavity, in the fecal stool material, and in the oral cavity. And there are changes within each individual's microbiome because not every lineage line here from the dietary intervention is identical. Um, so with that in hand, uh, you can see that microbial communities are personalized, and that's very typical types of data for dietary studies. The dietary stage, interestingly, had a, only a subtle effect on shifting the gut microbiomes. You could sort of tell that from the clustering dendrograms we just looked at. And then here's that same type of data in an ordination analysis. Uh, fecal uh, material from cohort one versus cohort two, and the color coding is before, during, and after. Um, the p-values show us that there is a significant fact, fact factor in influencing the microbiomes, but the amount of variation attributed to that is quite modest in cohort one versus cohort two. So diet isn't radically moving the microbiomes during this intervention. And relative to this question about uh, how the variation sorts across self-identity groups, consistently we find in cohort one and in cohort two about a five to seven percent of the microbiome variation associates with the self-reported identity social groups. And so this was consistent across both cohorts and across the dietary intervention. It didn't matter what stage we were looking at. In fact, this is all of the data from each cohort compiled together. There is a significant association. And moreover, we can dig deeper into beyond composition states, the types of bacteria and how many are different between the self-identity groups. So this kind of gives us a broad numerical categorization of there are lots of taxa, 47% cohort one, 22% cohort two, that are differentially abundant across these social identity groups, um, and that they are including some of the heritable taxa that we originally found in the study that was working on the American Gut Project and the Human Microbiome Project, but in this case, it's our Nashville clinical cohort. So there's some recurrence here, and one of those recurrent uh, heritable bacteria is known as odor, odor bacteriaceae, 
Um, this is a small metabolite producer of the healthy metabolite butyrate. It's considered protective against several gut inflammation uh, diseases. Uh, it's also associated with healthy aging and cardiometabolic health. It's a healthy uh, type of group of bacteria, and it appears to be uh, significantly more common in blacks versus whites. Now, across the metagenomic data that we achieved, so this is moving beyond taxa, but to metagenomic functions, um, we can look at various types of categories. So Jun Hui, uh, Liz, and then Rob were part of this uh, multi-omic analysis involving metagenomics and metabolomics. And I'll walk you through what you're looking at here that they produce. So there's a gut metagenome row, there's an oral metagenome row, and there's a gut virome uh, row. And in this particular column, we're looking at the conserved gene categories, or COGS. You know, these relate to very basic fundamental processes, protein metabolism, nucleotide metabolism, um, et cetera. And we can see in those very conserved categories that there's always a significant effect of self-identity group um, across all three sites that were sampled. The same is also true for antibiotic resistance genes, or ARGs, um, with the oral metagenome having the highest associated variation, 13.2% of the variation in, the, um, in these categories can be attributed to self-reported identity and social group versus 7% and 6% in the gut. And then when we get to chasms, uh, chasms are just carbohydrate digestive enzymes. So they break down sugars and fibers, et cetera. And the whopper again was in the oral metagenome. So 33% of the variation um, can be explained by self-reported identity group with respect to the types of uh, sugar carbohydrate digestive enzymes found in the microbial metagenome. And more specifically, there was a trend uh, in which one group had sort of a higher ability to have fiber digestion, and another ability had a, a, a higher ability enrichment to digest sugars. Um, and so these may reflect lifestyle differences that also lead to microbiome compositional differences as well as now these genetic functional uh, differences. So to sum up all of this data in sort of a guts of the matter approach to what's significant across cohort one, across cohort two, and then in each of the three sites we sampled for taxonomy, COGS, antibiotic resistance genes, chasms, and then even with, with respect to ethnicity or race, and we also collected data on antibiotic use, hormonal contraceptive use, since these are all females, and I want to summarize this through some labeling. So in cohort one and cohort two, the gut microbiome is always correlated with significance in terms of taxonomy and with respect to all three categories. So this really emphasizes the usefulness of having metadata to understand what associates with this kind of variation. The other signal that's worth pointing out is the gut virome is a blazing consistent signal uh, for taxonomy, for COGS, for antibiotic resistance genes across all three categories again. And this really has my attention right now because the gut virome appears to contain a better signature of, of fine scale differences than the microbiome does. So when we think about mobile elements, this really doesn't surprise us, right? Because they are often the diversifiers of bacterial genomes and they may be holding to some of the secrets on what explains the differences between individuals and across these categories. Now, there was a paper that came out in 2010, one of the early virome papers from the human world. And each one of these uh, columns here, or charts, is an individual's, uh, essentially, their virome metagenomic functional potential, or COG categories, the conserved genetic functional categories that are color-coded for the virome versus those individuals' microbiomes. And what you can see is that the functional potential of an individual's metagenome from the microbiome almost looks identical across all individuals, right? These are high-level, conserved functional categories, and we all tend to have the same abundances. But the virome is what makes us unique from a metagenomic functional perspective. And I think our finding previously really works well with what this early study reported on. It certainly highlights for me the virome may hold a lot more for us than we have appreciated so far in the microbiome sciences. So uh, just to kind of move into a little bit of a broad scale wrap up, uh, it's clear that the trend line for using self-reported ethnicity and race is going up in the publication literature in the microbiome sciences. It's also clear that we're doing this without having the right metadata underneath it. These are, again, ghost variables that underpin a lot of our lived experiences, lived experiences.
And this article in particular, De Wolf et al. 2021, is a great call to action for thinking about what other data we need to incorporate in our microbiome studies that get to the bottom of some of these associations. So when thinking about the rules of microbiome variation within humans, um, we've made the case for why we need to do this from these two perspectives. And with some of the data we now have, it's clear that we can think bigger, right? That we can think about, does the microbiome variation in healthy subjects also underpin what might be going on in subjects that are ill? And if so doing, can we develop social and environmental strategies that have more inclusive therapeutics and diagnostics? And so the, I expect there'll be a very big phase of research around these particular types of questions coming out of the recognition of um, these more personalized or population level differences in microbiomes. To speak a little bit to that in a little bit of an indirect way, a former grad student, Rob, who is now working at Estee Lauder for skin microbiome work, um, asked this particular question in the lab. Do microbiome linked human genes associate with disease across biobanks? So here he's taking human genes that have been linked to controlling microbial abundances in the gut microbiome, and then asking, do those genes tend to be enriched in disease states across biobanks? Bio this is what's known as a FIWA study or phenome-wide association study for the genes identified. And so across 90,000 uh, BioVU subjects in this particular uh, database that we used, um, we then stratified those subjects to European and African ancestry and use the 900 genes that are in the human genome that have been linked to microbiome changes, and then essentially ask, does that gene correlate with diseases as well as the microbial abundance changes that were driving the selection of these particular 900 genes? Now, this is from pre-existing data. So we knew these 900 genes already correlated with microbes, but we didn't know if they correlate with disease. And so in this study, we stratified the data for good reasons because uh, of ancestry differences between groups. And what we found in the European ancestry is that there were 31 associations of these genes, or, or, or sorry, of, of 10 genes out of the 900, that associate with common things that we hear about in the microbiome literature. Cardiovascular circulatory system diseases, um, neurological diseases, so think about uh, gut-brain access type, type things here, and endocrine and metabolic diseases, think about that here. And sorry, for those that haven't seen these Manhattan plots, what this indicates is a whole bunch of data in which we're asking, does the gene associate with the disease? And if it's above this dotted significance line, we consider it significant. So everything up here is significant. Everything at the bottom, you know, most of those 900 genes are not significant. And here are their locations um, across the genome. So uh, because we had 10 genes with 31 associations, we're mapping those 31 associations across the chromosomes here. Now, where it gets interesting is that for African ancestry, we could find no uh, GWAS signal, no micro, no human gene to disease signal. And this is intriguing, either because we admittedly have a smaller sample size in the African ancestry subjects in the database than we do in the European database. So that could explain why we don't have significance. Or it could be that uh, we really do have to take in consideration ancestry differences in thinking about um, how previously identified human genes that interact with microbes, largely from white and European ancestry backgrounds, have driven our genetic databases as well as our microbiome databases. And now we may not find the same associations when proxying those data databases with those particular um, biased gene sets relative to other ancestry groups. Again, could be a small sample size effect or it could be related to that, and we won't be able to solve that until we have a higher sample size. Um, but it certainly has set the stage for thinking more deeply about the need for linked microbiome and genome data sets from the diversity of all of us. Okay, so there is a ton of interest in thinking about microbes and social lived experiences and the papers that are coming out really reflect a lot of interest in how we move these topics forward in a sensitive way. And I appreciate all the, all the colleagues who put a lot of effort into thinking about this. Um, we ourselves are working with social scientists now to really uh, merge our lexicons, our concepts, our terms, um, and also get better data that has social science data as well as uh, microbial life sciences data. So there is a massive uh, imperative now to kind of think about incorporating social scientists into this research because it will change the dialogue and discoveries.
The science is uh, moving fast. Of course, it always does in human world. Uh, but it's clear that we can't just think about social effects, uh, but we need to think about environmental effects and pollution effects, uh, where we live and what we're exposed to. And so population health scientists are really well positioned um, for this kind of work with biologists. So what do we need? Uh, I, we're going to need longitudinal data across life that can better track some of these early life to later life uh, patterns as well as changes in the microbiomes and biomes. We're going to need functional mechanistic studies where we have the knowledge and the data on who are people's contacts, what are their microbiomes and biomes, what's their diet, what's their stress levels, uh, et cetera. We're going to need experimental designs that are better. So, you know, one way to do this kind of science is we don't have to think about comparing social identity groups to each other. We could take just one social identity group and within and of itself, if it was big enough, that we'd have a ton of variation to look at from a lived experiences perspective to look at how factors influence microbiomes um, just within the context of the data within one group. And maybe we'll have in the long term recommendations for intervention strategies and policies. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned before, a more personalized uh, thinking, at least, if not population level, thinking about therapeutics or ways to engineer and alter our microbiome in light of these differences. Okay, so an important context in the longitudinal aspect of what we need and what we have shown so far is that what happens early in life can influence our health status later in life. This is what's known as the DOHAD hypothesis or the developmental origins of health and disease. And since we see that there are these microbiome differences that emerge at three months of age, when lived experiences start to influence their microbiomes much more, it's important to think about those microbiome acquisition differences could affect immune system development, metabolic and hormonal development, that ultimately leads to uh, microbiome differences and potentially disease onset differences or risks uh, later in life. Okay, and finally, I'll just end on the most biggest picture, which is an emphasis to think about host biology in a much bigger way. We normally think about uh, ourselves, animals, and plants through the lens of a single bion species, right? We have nuclear genomes that are largely vertically transmitted, and sometimes there's some recombination that mixes up our genes, especially from sexual reproduction. And our genomes aren't static. You know, they're, of course, mixed up from mobile DNA and regular old autosomes. And on the other hand, if, if we think about <clears throat> host biology in light of the microbiome and incorporate it directly into our thinking of what that organism is, the microbiome adds such a rich complexity, but there's some parallel concepts too. The microbiome is partially vertically transmitted. It's also horizontally transmitted, so that's a difference, but it's not so different from recombination conceptually because recombination and horizontal transmission both mix up nuclear genes or microbes, respectively. So these are just diversifying forces uh, on a continuum, really. And then, of course, the microbiome is complex, uh, far more complex than our nuclear genome. But then again, our nuclear genome isn't this single homogenous entity in and of itself. So when we think about an organism and then the whole system together, there's really some nice conceptual continuums and it drives a lot of our thinking about what we've done in the human microbiome and also insect microbiome worlds about a bigger picture of thinking about the whole system together. All right, so just to recap and then I'll end here. There's, um, there's a clear pattern that we found in uh, early life to adult life across the United States with respect to social identity groups. And those validate now across two public data sets and then our clinical cohort as well. In our clinical cohort, we ruled out dietary intervention on at least a short time period for influencing that adult microbiome variation. So there are either other factors or a different way of approaching the diet that could affect those results. The virome really holds most of the interesting secrets and significant factors in our studies. Uh, and I think that it will prescribe some prominence going forward about how we think about our work in this, in this, in this area. And then finally, you know, our own human genome is having an influence on the types of microbes that do get to come in, and then the risk factors associated with those particular gene by microbe interactions. Uh, so this really gets us back to that whole system view of things. And so with that, I 
thank you so much for inviting me, uh, the honor of joining your symposia and your group, and I'll be happy to take questions uh, at any time today uh, or offline if you'd like to reach out and don't get a chance to ask me a question. Thank you.